Tigris 115 requested multiple times, twice actually, requested twice that I do a Manoraptor or a Manoraptor form, which are two different things, but Dale, one of our local members, gave me a Therizinosaurus toy. And I know it's a Therizinosaurus toy because one, what else would this be? And two, it says it on the belly. So I get to kill two birds with one stone as far as requests go. Some of you might be surprised to hear me say that Therizinosaurus was a Manoraptor. Until about 10 years ago, a lot of paleontologists would be surprised to hear me say that. It was originally discovered in the 50s. It was described by the same guy that uh, described Tarbosaurus a couple of episodes ago. Uh, but it was such fragmentary remains, really all we had that was of substance was the claws themselves. So he named it Scythe Lizard. But the specific name meant turtle formed. And that's because he thought that it was a group of giant sea turtles. So it wasn't until about 20 years later that a different Soviet scientist was working on them and he had a little more material to work with. And he decided that Therizinosaurus was actually a theropod dinosaur. And then it wasn't until really the, the late 90s that we had enough specimens from both uh, China and from North America uh, that we could actually piece together the ancestry of this guy. We still don't have that much material from Therizinosaurus itself, but because comparative anatomy exists and because cladistics exists, we can infer what it looked like based on the related species. This particular toy, it looks like the manufacturer went to a lot of trouble to present Therizinosaurus as accurately as they could at the time that it was made. Unfortunately, a lot of the finer detailing is wrong. So let's just get right to it. I, it breaks my heart because they've actually gone to the trouble of depicting a theropod non-tripodally with its spine parallel to the ground. Unfortunately for Therizinosaurs, that is not accurate. <laughs> they, based on biomechanics of their hip and the structure of their necks, it would be much more comfortable for them to stand vertically. Not completely vertically, and they definitely didn't stand on their tails like a kangaroo, but contrary to basically everything you probably know about theropods, they, they did not stand parallel to the ground. The center of gravity is just too far forward to allow such a thing. The tail is so short and the arms are so huge That is just not practical to pose it like this. Like they've, they've even tried to give it these flat feet so that, oh, it could totally stand like this, except that it can't. So it has to knuckle drag like those reconstructions of Platyosaurus. Platyosaurus is an interesting dinosaur to bring up because for a while there was a theory floating around that these were actually a Cretaceous. I should mention that this guy was in the late Cretaceous in Mongolia. But there was a theory that they were actually a Cretaceous expression of the prosauropod family lineage. That was before we figured out that they're supposed to be called platyosaurids. Because the suite of characteristics that this guy exhibits are just not consistent with what we know or knew at the time, I should say, about uh, theropods in general and manoraptors specifically. I keep saying manoraptors, I should really define that. Manoraptors are all theropods that are more closely related to modern birds than they are to ornithomimids. I mentioned the hip earlier, I should probably start there. There's a North American therizinosaur called Falcarius, which also means scythe, uh, that has a much more standard theropod or saurischian hip. Whereas the more derived Therizinosaurs, like Therizinosaurus, have the reverse pubis that you see in a lot of more advanced Manoraptors. So that was another problem with classifying this guy because at first glance it seems to have an Ornithischian hip. Although I point out, birds also have what looks like an Ornithischian hip, but they are in fact Saurischian dinosaurs. What's in a name? The reason I mentioned the hip is that the morphology of the ilium was such that 
we figured the leg muscles were much beefier than is actually portrayed here. They've sort of got the leg muscles hanging off of the uh, hip. They've got the right proportions on the legs, though. They're, they're, they were quite stocky. The, the comparison that people keep making is ground sloths, which is not a terribly good name for those animals. I would prefer to call them elephant bears, even though they're not even related to elephants or bears, but it gives you a better idea of what their niche would be. But that was a Pleistocene mammal that had what looks like a pretty similar lifestyle to this guy. Uh, wasn't fast, but didn't need to be because it had really strong arms to be able to defend itself. There are some reconstructions that take that analogy really far, and they'll show it as literally a dinosaur equivalent to a ground sloth sitting on its tail all day, being, you know, with this huge gut hanging out in front of it. That's mostly speculation at this point, but it is kind of cool that there's nothing to really dissuade from that interpretation. They're portraying it with a very flat spine uh, anterior to the hip. There's a related species, I believe also from North America, called Nothronychus. And it has what looks like a hunchback in between the shoulders and the hip. So you'll frequently see Therizinosaurus restored with that hump intact. They, don't, they haven't done it here, but I don't think we have enough material to say that it's wrong to not include it. Continuing our journey upwards. Oh, first I should mention the feet. They're not bad. They have actually done the accurate number of toes, which is lovely because most theropods you would see three toes, but in the more derived therizinosaurs you have four. They've also made an effort to make them look not like theropod feet. They look more like Ornithischian feet, actually, which is reasonably accurate, but they took it a little too far. They're probably too hoof-like. Get that closer to the other uh, Solarosaurian theropods and, and you're golden. I really don't have much problem with the uh, posture of the arms. Theoretically, it, it could extend its arms this way. Manoraptors had unique wrists, so the rest position for the arms was different than you'd see in other theropods. Uh, whereas most theropods would have their hand roughly parallel to the forearm with the upper arm uh, projecting backwards, Manoraptors had a tendency to, more like a bird, have the, the upper arm projecting out and then the wrist folded against the forearm. So it was, it was a much more compact package unless it decided to lash out. <laughs> And I say lashing out because, we, as far as we can figure, these giant claws... I should mention the scale of this, by the way. This was about the size of a Tyrannosaur, and those claws were over three feet long. As far as I know, they're the largest claws of any known animal. So that's pretty cool. But there were a few theories for a while about what it might have used those claws for. The most boring, in my opinion, was the manipulating plant matter theory. Uh, for a while it was thought that it might have been a burrower, but functionally it makes the most sense for them to be for defense. The, the animal wasn't a fast runner, and it doesn't seem to have, any kind of, have had any kind of armor, so about the only way that it could defend itself from predators would be to use its gigantic claws. That's not to say that it couldn't also use them for manipulating plant matter or manipulating dirt, but the most likely theory seems to be weaponry. The proportion of the claws, as I mentioned, is pretty good. They're maybe a little too small, and the shape of them is kind of screwy. They've given it this third surface, whereas in life it would have had a sharp edge on the inner edge, like a sickle or a scythe. I assume this has to do with it being a children's toy and therefore they can't put sharp parts on it. As far as the head goes, I do not think we actually have a head for this animal, but because we have 
related genre, we can infer what the head would have looked like. It would have been tiny, and it would have vaguely resembled a cross between a prosauropod, a hadrosaur, and a theropod skull. This is fairly accurate on all counts. It's got some shape issues, like the nostrils should be further forward, and the transition from the many small teeth to a beak should probably be a little further back in the mouth. The bottom contour of the jaw, as weird as it looks, is pretty accurate, though. And one of the first things I really should have mentioned about this dinosaur, which is one of the coolest things other than the giant killing claws, this was a herbivore. It's an herbivore descended from what was previously thought to be an entirely carnivorous group of vertebrates. The very earliest Therizinosaurs, like Falcarius, seem to have been omnivores, and that might have continued on further into the lineage, but by the time you got to the super-derived late Cretaceous Therizinosaurus, it seems to have been an obligate herbivore, which is to say it could only eat plants. And that's really something. The fact that it was a plant eater is relevant because they have portrayed it without cheeks, and while some of the primitive forms don't seem to have had cheeks, it seems like this one would have. The more advanced, I shouldn't say advanced, I should say derived, because it wasn't better, it was just more specialized. The more derived creatures seem to have had cheeks. To, to, it wasn't as complex as the chewing batteries that you saw in Ornithischians at the end of the Cretaceous, but it definitely looks like it could process food in its mouth. So you shouldn't be able to see all those teeth on the side of the mouth. There should be cheeks in the way. The final bullet point to cover is integument, which is a fancy word for covering. This toy has gone to the trouble of showing us the filamentous covering that we totally have evidence for in Therizinosaurs. There's a lot of feathered fossils coming out of China right now, and, well, ever since the late 90s. One of those, or several of those, were Bapiosaurus, which is a Therizinosaur much smaller than this one, that had a two-layered two -layered coat of proto-feathers. They aren't true feathers. This guy is portrayed in the toy with having these feathers on the, the arms and the tail that are clearly a shaft with a bunch of fibers coming off of it. Those are called panaceous feathers. As far as we know, they only occur in the more derived Manoraptors. We don't have any evidence for them in Therizinosaurus specifically, and we definitely don't have any evidence for them in other Silurosaurs. Now, as far as the covering goes, there were really two kinds. The first was somewhere between hair and down. It wasn't as fluffy as down, but it wasn't as bristly as hair. It, it was probably about the length of my hair, uh, but it had two or more filaments per base. So it would have been rather fluffy, and there are a bunch of theories. I could do a whole episode on where feathers came from, and why, and when, and how, but currently the best theories seem to be that it, they arose due to metabolic needs, of all things, but stick, stuck around because they were useful for display purposes, and then became useful for insulation. Now, as far as display purposes, that's where the second layer of protofeathers comes in, because those were much longer and more quill-like. They, they seem to have been one long, flat strand. Uh, uh, and, and the important thing was that it was puffable. So instead of this portrayal, which has it essentially being a, a swan-like neck, it would have been more like a rooster or a pigeon, where it could look relatively slim, but it could puff up. And there are some reconstructions that take that pretty far, and I think that's actually really cool. Uh, uh, based on Bapiosaurus, it doesn't look like it would have had a tail fan, but those long quill-like structures would definitely have been projecting uh, perpendicular to the forearm. So while the actual structure of the feathers themselves isn't accurate, their placement and possibly their length is. 
And you might ask, well, what in the world would the purpose of having the ability to puff your neck up be? I ask you to look at modern birds and their elaborate mating rituals, and anything that makes it more likely for a creature to mate gets passed down. So don't discount the fluffiness. I hope that whetted your appetite for mana raptors. Tigris 115, uh, thank you, Dale, for giving me the Therizinosaurus. That's all I can think of to say about it. Thank you for watching Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, tell me dinosaurs to take apart. Uh, you could even send me a toy dinosaur. Our address is in the description. Please visit thegeekgroup.org to find out how you can become a member and donate, and we'll see you next time. This video was made possible by a grant from the Future Girl Foundation. This video was made possible by thousands of private donations from members and viewers like you. Please visit thegeekgroup.org for more information on how you can donate and become a part of our dreams of Avalon. And it is this And it is it and it 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 I'm gonna not do that fancy transition and I'm just gonna go into it, okay. Quit it! Are you trying to drift? <laughs> okay. <clears throat>